Next, we have uh, Neelhara Mishra. Uh, Professor Neelhara is currently the Srimati Amma and Sri B.S. Shastri Associate Chair Professor in, uh, in Computer Science and Engineering. She works on various questions related to fair division on multivariate algorithm design uh, in various contexts, in the context of problems that arise in graph theory, computational social choice, constraint satisfaction, and other games. Right? So over to you, Neil. Thank you so much. I will see if I can successfully share my screen. Okay. Does that seem like it's working? Yeah. Slides are changing. Okay, great. So um, this is how you want to take the questions? It's a pretty informal forum. So yeah, yeah. So I think I'll keep an eye out on the chat and if there are any questions. Um Anirban, I hope you'll stick around to answer them. <laughs> so because I'm going to redirect uh, most likely. So, all right. So uh, uh, thanks uh, thanks very much, uh, Anirban, and also uh, Sudipta for the invitation. Um, I will try to outline um, a little, a uh, few glimpses. Uh, it's really a collection of anecdotes from the very long and rich history of- uh, There's, I mean, as the moderator, there's a question in the chat that I think was directed to Sudipta. Okay, uh, yeah. I, it, uh, I, I didn't notice it before. Say, so okay. as we know today, is it the same as Einstein published or has, have there been some modifications to it? So one line answer, the special relativity is exactly the same. Of course, there was much greater development called general relativity later. Thank you. Uh, sorry for interrupting me. Please go ahead. Not at all. Um, by the way, uh, the audio is okay, right? I don't know if I have selected the one. Yeah, yeah. Sounds okay. Okay, I've just switched to um, an actual microphone. Is it is it okay still? Yeah, cool. All right, thanks. Um, right, so I think... Um, uh, let me, uh, yeah, let me just begin by saying that uh, this is not a very uh, comprehensive uh, history and there's obviously uh, going to be tons of omissions, but I will try to uh, pull up some of my favorite anecdotes and we'll see how this goes. So um, here's sort of a rough outline. I'm going to start with, uh, you know, the earliest occurrences of algorithms. It's hard to pin this down because algorithmic thought is very ubiquitous. Uh, so this is going to be uh, just just a couple of brief glimpses just to give you a sense of for how long algorithmic thinking has been around. Um, and um, uh, the same with the origins, I just want to tell you where the name came from. Uh, but for the most part, uh, I'll be focusing on developments that happened in the early 1900s, where people uh, were really starting to uh, think about uh, computation and uh, the limits of computation at the same time. So it was a very exciting time where the uh, you know machines had just started um, uh, you know to be built and uh, there was a rapid explosion of computational power and at the same time there was a rapid development of ideas and what you might call the theory of computation so this uh, um, this will essentially be my main focus so it's kind of split into like the early ages when people first realized that there may actually be things, as is a bit of a spoiler alert, but there may be things that machines actually cannot do. And um, after that, people started asking more fine-grained questions about the things that the machines can, in fact, do. And they started worrying about how well they can do them. So that's going to be sort of the second part of um, this era that I want to talk about. And then now we go on to nitpick a little more, even within this, where we say, OK, now that we have some understanding of what but, um, you know, machines can and cannot do um, among um, so among the things that they cannot do well, how how much can we push the boundaries of how well they can do things that we have said they cannot do very well. So that may sound a little bit confusing at this stage, but that's kind of roughly, uh, you know, what I'm going to cover. And um, of course, I'll just try to give you again very brief glimpses of uh, you know, uh, how algorithms manifest in you know, modern life and society. They seem to be everywhere. Um, and um, you know, some of us uh, may also feel that um, you know, while they make our lives very, very convenient in many ways, there may also be a few things to worry about. So I'll just leave you with some food for thought, hopefully. There will also be like, uh, I think Sudipta, I also have a list of things that we will probably not be able to get into. And here are some uh, keywords. I mean, these themes may come up here and there. 
uh, but I'm deliberately not going to be focusing on developments in, for instance, programming languages, software engineering, hardware. Uh, there's a huge intersection with uh, philosophy, logic, AI, crypto, information theory, and I will not be able to get into, um, unfortunately, I'll not be able to get into uh, much of that. So with those uh, sort of disclaimers out of the way, I'm more or less ready to get started. Before, um, before we uh, sort of start off on the timeline, uh, you might you might wonder about you know uh, what an algorithm is and um if that's um, that's something you haven't encountered in let's say coursework for instance then i would recommend going to youtube and searching for the exact instructions challenge if you've not seen this already so this is um <laughs> this is a pretty funny set of videos where um, um a dad asks um, his kids to come up with a recipe so if you've seen algorithms in your coursework chances are that some of the first definitions you encounter will liken algorithms with recipes, like literal recipes from the kitchen, uh, because uh, there are lots of similarities between um, you know, the, the way an algorithm looks and the way a recipe looks as a series of precise instructions, except that when it comes to algorithms, especially ones that you actually ask your computer to uh, work, work out for you, you do need those instructions to be quite precise. So this challenge um, involves asking people to come up with um, with precise instructions to, in this case, I think make a, a peanut butter jelly sandwich or something like this. And uh, it's, it's pretty funny what happens when people follow these instructions to the letter, um, because it often turns out that what you get at the end is very different from uh, what you might have expected. So it's pretty amusing. Um, this also features in, uh, I think, the opening lecture of Harvard's uh, CS50, which I think is Programming 101. And uh, the instructor has this uh, demonstration where, again, I think they are, for some reason, there seems to be this obsession with uh, peanut butter jelly sandwiches. So that's what they're trying to make. And they kind of try to follow instructions that come in from the audience. Um, and as you can probably guess from the picture, it's not going very well, but I think they managed to make something at the end of it. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to kind of uh, get into formal definitions of algorithms. Maybe some ideas will, will emerge, but for now you could really think of it as, um, uh, as a well-defined procedure that's, uh, that's designed to achieve a specific task. And all of this can be formalized in different ways, depending on the context. So um, I guess the earliest appearances of algorithms actually happened in ancient mathematics. So people needed to um, add, subtract, and divide numbers and things like this. So a lot of the descriptions for how you do such things were procedural. So they had a strong algorithmic flavor. This shows up in a um, um, map of antiquity, starting from the Egyptian and Babylonian traditions. Also, Greek mathematicians had algorithms that I think are sort of in place and popular to this day uh, in terms of um, algorithms that can find primes. This is a pretty tedious process. This is, um, of course, uh, we know that we can do a lot better thanks to a famous primality test in um, the early 2000s, 2000, 2002 perhaps from, uh, this is the famous AKS algorithm um, uh, that, that was published from IIT Kanpur in fact, but that's, um, that's jumping way ahead. So just continuing um, from um, these sort of older times, um, you know, even uh, even the algorithm that uh, we have from um, from these times for finding the greatest common divisor of two numbers, uh, it's a really elegant recursive algorithm. It uh, it's goes by, um, uh, it's, it's called the Euclidean algorithm, and it's something uh, that we use, I think, to this day. Um, Closer home, uh, I think Aryabhat also came up with uh, uh, with an algorithmic process for finding integer solutions of uh, linear Diffie-Einstein equations. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, but uh, I think it's called the Kuttak, and it has something to do with um, I think the semantics of the word has something to do with how you're breaking down the problem into smaller pieces and solving them and putting the pieces back together, which I think is a fairly fundamental algorithmic strategy or a style of doing things. And this clearly goes way back. Um, okay, sorry, I think I jumped a slide there. Um, similarly, uh, we've had, um, you know, we've, we've had things that show up in modern texts. And I won't go into uh, the definitions of things like Knight's doors or Hamiltonian cycles or Fibonacci numbers. Chances are that these are fairly popular ideas and you've seen them, but if you haven't, don't have to worry about it. But these ideas have origins 
Uh, again, going uh, going way back. So I just wanted to uh, give a hat tip to the very early origins of um, algorithmic problems, thinking, and uh, concepts. Um, as far as the name itself, I think it's um, uh, it comes from the name of a Persian mathematician. Um, I think. Um, uh, Quarism is probably how, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, is how his name is pronounced. And I think he wrote a very popular, uh, you know, a very popular text at the time, uh, which introduced the decimal number system. He was extremely widely read for at, at the time. And um, I think this, uh, this text had a lot of impact because it brought in a convenient way of uh, being able to write numbers down, which had huge implications in terms of making calculations efficient. So um, so I think there was some sort of, uh, 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 I think, uh, I guess his name perhaps got a little bit lost in translation and finally morphed into uh, the English word algorithm, which eventually evolved as algorithm. So I think if you look at the word algorithm, you can probably break it down in some intuitive way and sort of imagine that it has some, it has some standard context and standard meaning, but apparently the word actually does have a slightly different origin. And it's not, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not that it just comes from Latin roots and the words have meanings associated with computation. As far as I know, that's uh, not the case. So uh, moving on, um, think early um, in, uh, in the night. Okay, so let me maybe start off by, although I did say that machines and hardware will not feature very much in my story, I think it feels a bit incomplete to not talk about them at all. So as I said, there was, um, you know, the, the machines for automating tedious computations had started to uh, make their presence felt already in the 1800s. So you had the difference engine uh, from Charles Babbage. And um, I think, uh, unfortunately, so I think he proposed this machine uh, to the Royal Astronomical Society at the time. I think the temptation was that it would help them, uh, again, automate a lot of tedious computation. Uh, he did receive some funding for it, but unfortunately, it turned out that he had vastly underestimated uh, the cost of building uh, the, the machine. It was a very ambitious project. And I think this is a fairly dramatic story on its own right in terms of the ups and the downs. And I think they eventually did manage to build out a few variations. But um, I think ultimately, as far as I know, the machine that was originally uh, proposed uh, was, was uh, ultimately not built uh, during Babbage's time. I, I think other people picked up on it um, later on. So, uh, so I think he had incurred fairly significant losses along the way. And as I said, I think managed to salvage it and build some interim machines that could do um, uh, that, that could do more than the initial prototype, but not as much as was initially promised. Around this time, um, uh, Ada Lovelace was uh, widely credited as being the world's first programmer because she could write, I mean, she had written, she exchanged notes with uh, Babbage on several occasions. And I think she came up with this uh, procedure in, uh, in code where the code where it was basically instructions for which knobs and dials to turn on the, on the difference in, the, in, what, in what sequence. And this was code to compute uh, Bernoulli numbers. And uh, I think it was um, it was credited as being very clean code. Unfortunately, I think because the, um, uh, I think the machine didn't get built. I don't know if this code was actually, my understanding is that this, this code wasn't actually executed during her lifetime, which was unfortunately relatively short. Um, and I believe like the, the issue of whether it's appropriate to think of Lovelace as a, as a programmer um, is, uh, has been subject to a little bit of debate. I think not everybody necessarily agrees, but I will quote Wolfram here who says that, um, you know, she, she definitely uh, did put together a clear exposition of the abstract operation of the machine, something that, that Babbage never did. I think some of the confusion was that between all the back and forth and the letters, it wasn't clear. Um, it looked like, of course, Babbage was also putting together a number of recipes for doing a bunch of calculations as well. So, so uh, some of the criticism perhaps stems from uh, the lack of clarity on who did what, but I think Wolfram sounds pretty confident when he says that um, what uh, what Lovelace had done at the time uh, uh, definitely counts as uh, significant and uh, non-trivial. So the machines kept uh, sort of getting better. So a lot of it, I think, came from um, requirements that were emerging in physics and other disciplines. So for instance, uh, this was 
uh, harmonic analyzer made by Lord Kelvin. I think this was in the late 1800s. Um, uh, fairly intricate uh, machinery under the hood here could uh, detect uh, changes in atmospheric pressure and uh, you know other. I think a few other parameters. Uh, this was um, uh, this was a little bit later into the next uh, um, uh, into the next century, probably mid 1950s, if I'm not wrong. So it's the automatic computing engine, which was um, designed by Turing. And I think at some point, um, he was involved in the uh, in, in, in building it as well. But I think at some point, he got disillusioned by perhaps the lack of progress. And, you know, I think he kind of walked out on that a little bit. And I think others took it up and, and finally, uh, finally built it. Uh, this is a pretty fascinating <laughs> video that talks about um, uh, the the uh, mechanical fire control systems inside Navy ships again mid 1950s. Uh, it's really uh, it's, it's amazing. There's a there's a whole lot going on in uh, in these uh, these are these are mechanical computers before uh, you know before the uh, revolution and happened on the electronic side. And uh, in fact, I think there is an article which says that in some ways the new Navy computers fall short of the power of 1930s tech. So if you're interested in that sort of thing you you might find this like a pretty cool excursion there's a more modern explainer video that that i thought was very fun and i think if i remember correctly um this was uh, uh, this was shared by or pointed out to me by manish jen so thanks to him for that this is a really cool video which talks about how these mechanical devices can do uh, integration for example and so on and so forth so this is all very good i think the 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 early days of the rise of the machines was very exciting there's a lot going on um and I'm, uh, this is even pre uh, microprocessors pre electronics and so on um so the, the so it was clear that the machines are going to go Going to keep getting better, but um, as such, the discipline of computing was not about the study of specific machines. It was really the more general, um, the more general study of what can we hope from these machines, what can we hope for them to do, and so on. This is a slightly controversial quote from Dijkstra, who is, by the way, generally speaking, a very quotable computer scientist. So there's a uh, there's a really a nice talk about uh, the life of life and times of Dijkstra by uh, uh, Professor Madhavan uh, in a in a lecture series about Turing Award winners. I think Dijkstra received his Turing Award in 72. So, um, so Turing Award is, of course, named after Alan Turing, uh, who is widely regarded as uh, one of the founding uh, fathers of modern uh, theory of computation, computer science, um, as you like it. And uh, the award is named in his honor and is considered to be uh, the top achievement in computer science. And a lot of people would equate it or liken it to, let's say, a Nobel Prize in the sciences, et cetera, and uh, perhaps uh, the Fields Medal in mathematics. I think uh, uh, this logistical differences, I think they're, they're handed out every year and so on, and there's perhaps no age limit, et cetera. But, but in, in terms of um, uh, in, in terms of prestige, I think uh, this is uh, about as good as it gets. So, um, so this is a uh, this is a really nice talk about uh, Dijkstra's personality, his contributions, and so on. And one of the things that came out clearly was that. He said very interesting things and is eminently quotable. So he did say that computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. It's arguably a good analogy, although I wouldn't want to comment on it because I don't know how tenacious the relationship is between astronomy and telescopes, uh, but it's, it's probably um, a fair analogy to some extent, at least in the context of uh, theory of computation. The idea is to emphasize the fact that um, you know the the uh, it's it's really not about how much uh, how, how much more powerful you can make the machines. It's about abstracting out the essence of computation, trying to study it as a whole, independent of the details of a specific machines because uh, of any specific machine, because those are going to come and go, and it would be really annoying to have to update your your theory every couple of years because uh, the technology has advanced. So. Um, so one question that you can ask, which is fairly fundamental, is are there things that computers simply cannot do, no matter how powerful are there problems for which you know, there's no algorithm that can solve them? Um, and again, I'm going to outsource um, uh, the answer to this question to this uh, beautiful talk at the Royal Institute by Kevin uh, Buzzard, who talks about the history of the P versus NP problem, which we are going to get to uh, in a bit as well. Um, so one of the things that uh, he says in his talk, and I'm kind of shamelessly 
really plagiarized this um, uh, this this presentation. So. Um, so th there are things that you can do, for example, again, going back to ancient mathematics, if you wanted to talk about um, whether it's possible to bisect an angle using a ruler and a compass, it turns out that sure enough, you can do it. And um, uh, Euclid uh, showed us how. Um, I guess it's so it's actually not very complicated, but I'm not, I'm not going to try and demonstrate it now, but it turns out uh, you know, that, that you can use a compass to identify a point from where if you, you know, kind of draw a line, it turns out to be, uh, you, you draw a line from the um, uh, from the source of the angle and it turns out to be the bisecting line. So, and you can prove that that's actually a procedure that's going to work. So, so to show that something is possible, um, you have a constructive argument typically uh, to show that something can be done. On the other hand, you might also be interested, or it might just be true that something cannot be done. So for instance, if instead of bisecting an angle, you wanted to trisect an angle with the same constraints using a ruler and a compass, it turns out that this is not possible. But the machinery to show that it's not possible, as you can imagine, this is a, this already sounds like a heavier statement to prove because you're trying to say that among all possible procedures that you can think of and you can let your imagination run wild in terms of the things you can possibly do, this is a pretty strong statement. It's saying that none of them would actually be able to trisect an angle uh, if uh, you were only working with a ruler and a compass. So it turns out that proving a statement like this requires more sophisticated machinery and it isn't as straightforward as say demonstrating that something can, can be done. So in general, showing that something cannot be done turns out to be harder than showing that something can be done. This will be a running theme um, as, as we go along the story. So um, I think this is pretty much what we were just saying. So you can prove that something is possible by doing it, but to show that something is impossible is generally trickier and it requires developing more machinery. Um, here's an example of something that Turing and many others were starting to worry about. So, um, so they were starting to worry about, well, are there things that computers cannot do? And what I'm gonna show you now is an example of something that a computer cannot do, no matter how well equipped the actual physical computing machine is. So uh, here's an example of a typical computer program written in pseudocode. Again, I, I, if, yeah, I think again, stolen from, uh, from the talk that I pointed to earlier. So here's what the program does. It asks the user, to, uh, asks the user for a number. And uh, depending on what the user has input, it has uh, slightly different behaviors. So it says that if the user has input seven, then we'll go to step four. Step four says go to step five and step five says go to step four. On the other hand, if the user inputs something other than seven, then it says, well, I'll go to step six. And step six, the program prints hello and it's done. Okay, so um, you can probably guess what's, uh, what's coming up. So suppose you user that inputs, maybe you don't know the internals of the program, it's, it's just an innocuous program asking you for a number, and suppose you happen to be somebody for whom like seven is your favorite number, so you input seven, and then what, what's going to happen is that the program goes to step four, from here it goes to step five, from step five it goes to step four, and da da da, it keeps doing this dance, and this is never going to stop, right? So let's say that a program that gets stuck in this fashion is a program that um, that's a bad program. You you can think of this as a program that's crashed. It's going to it's going to bring it's going to bring your machine down. It's, it's never your machine is never going to free up from having to run this program. So that's a bad situation to be in. And and remember, Turing is uh, Turing and others uh, like him are, are thinking about these issues even before uh, even before computers as we know them are even around. So these are sort of thought experiments, if you like, and that's a part of the uh, sort of the genius of this, um, uh, this, this sort of thought process, the timing of it is, is quite incredible. So um, just going back to what we were saying, so you have uh, a, a computer program is said to be a bad program if it causes the machine to crash, it just gets stuck forever. And it's good if, you know, it doesn't get stuck um, on, um, in, in this fashion. 
Okay, so um, although here I've kind of uh, said that we call a program good or bad, I'll think of it as a program equipped with an input. So a program, so this program that we saw here is a good program if the input is anything other than seven. And it's a bad program if the input is seven. So, um, so that's, that's, that's what we want to talk about. We, I think it's interesting. If a, if a computer program is good or not, I think this is a this is a very practical problem to this day. If somebody has written a piece of code, you want to know, well, is this particular, you know, is it going to crash if it's given uh, this particular input? Or you could ask the more general question about is is there some input on which it's going to crash, right? So these are uh, these are clearly relevant um, uh, relevant questions that, that you would like to know answers to. So it would be really cool if you could write a meta program, which took a program as an input and tried to figure out if that program was good or bad. So that's the sort of question that Turing was worrying about. And uh, it turns out that he was able to prove that, that this, is, uh, this is actually uh, not doable. You cannot write a program that can effectively determine if another program is going to crash or not, you cannot predict whether a program is good or bad. And um, I think a lot of the philosophical thought process here was inspired by um, uh, Godel's ideas of incompleteness and um, uh, the paradoxes of Russell at the time and so on. So, um, so in fact, we're going to step back a little bit and talk about the broader context um, uh, at the time. But before that, let me, this is like a cute idea. I'm kind of hand-waving a lot of formalism, but the, the basic idea that, that was driving the, the proof of this fact uh, was uh, a simple argument by contradiction. I mean, simple, but mind blowing at the same time, okay? So, so here's the, uh, here is the premise. Suppose you had a program that could check if a program crashes on a given input or not. Suppose, suppose hypothetically you had such a program. Then here's something that you can do. You can use that program to write another program. Okay, here is another program that I'm going to write. You have given me a black box, a black box is the diamond in the center, which can figure out if you know something is a good program or not. So here is a wrapper program around this, okay, which uses this uh, hypothetical program, which can figure out if another program crashes or not. This hypothetical program is being used here uh, because you know if it's a program that exists, I can invoke it, I can call it. So here's the wrapper program. The wrapper program takes a program as input and figures out if it's a good program or a bad program. If it's a good program, then this wrapper program behaves like a bad program. It's going to loop forever. On the other hand, if the input program is a good program, um, I'm sorry, it's a bad program. If the input program is a bad program, then the wrapper program is going to behave like a good program. So essentially it's flipping the behavior of the input program. So you give this wrapper program a good program, the wrapper algorithm, the wrapper program becomes a bad one. You give it a good one, it becomes a bad one. If you give it a bad one, it becomes a good one, right? So that's what the wrapper program does. And now the, the sort of mind blowing thing that you want to do is to ask, um, is the wrapper program a good program when it takes itself as input, right? Um, so, this is like a nice fun thing to think about. And again, if you're familiar with classical paradoxes, you'll probably, uh, uh, and, and in case you haven't seen this before, then uh, you, you will find that the, the reasoning is of a similar flavor. So let's take a deep breath and ask ourselves what happens if the input to this, so remember that this program takes programs as input, and this program itself is a program, so you can input it to itself. Right? So suppose you feed this program into this program and uh, you say, okay, it should be, uh, suppose you, you hypothesize that this is a good program, okay? When this program takes itself as input, it's a good program, but then what happens? Well, the program takes itself as input and if it's a good program, it becomes a bad one, right? So, well, it's actually not a good program. <laughs> on the other hand, if you decide that this program, when it's acting on itself as input, is a bad program, then when you take 
this program has input, the black box algorithm, which is supposed to correctly detect if there are crashes, is going to say, okay, it is a bad program. It's, it's not a good program. Then, well, then you're going to follow the bottom part of the, of the flow chart and you're going to actually behave well. So if, <laughs> if, the, um, if you suspect that the behavior of this program on itself is, um, you know, so I think I, I probably could have done a better job with the notation here. Maybe it's a little bit confusing. So P is really encapsulating a program and an input. So what P is taking is the wrapper program with itself as input. So it's a little bit, um, it's, it's probably not as clear the way I've written it, but hopefully the spirit of what I'm saying is uh, somewhat coming across. So essentially, you, it's, it's basically a contradictory situation. There's no way out this program doesn't have the appropriate behavior. So if you hypothesize that the program, uh, when it, it's fed itself as input, should be a good program, then the behavior of this program, when, when it takes itself as input, is in fact bad, and conversely. So that's why you have a contradiction. And the only assumption that you have made so far that you cannot potentially justify is the assumption that there is such a program which can check if another program on some input is a good program or not. So that assumption has to be false because it's leading us to a contradiction. So, okay, so I think all the tongue twisty part is done. And, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, if, if not the specifics, as I said, I'm like being hand wavy about stuff, but this is essentially in the spirit of what I call diagonalization arguments. And they are, uh, you can find them plentifully in, uh, in, in logic and, and so forth. So the idea is that you can, you can use arguments in that spirit to reason about the limits of computation. So just uh, backing up a little bit. So in, in fact, it turns out, okay, let me just skip ahead. Um, uh, let me just skip ahead here. So it turns out that this sort of line of thought and reasoning was, uh, was prompted in response to a question that Hilbert had posed as a part of his uh, you know, famous list of problems. So I think he had he had posed um, um, something called the decision problem. The German word is on the slide. I'm not even going to attempt pronouncing it. But uh, but he basically asked if uh, you know if if you can design an algorithm which uh, which can figure out given a statement if the statement um, you know if if the statement has a proof or not. So again, this is just, um, uh, okay, the, the, the words on the slides are essentially quoted from the Wikipedia version of this problem. And I think, of course, the, the actual details are murkier, but the, um, the main takeaway here is, and I'm quoting from, um, again, a beautiful book called Mathematics and Computation by Abby Victorson. Um, and, and the way he puts it is that during Shadow's Hilbert's first dream, I think Hilbert was hopeful for having, uh, so I think this was a time when, you know, we were, we were trying to understand what does it mean to understand something, right? If you want to understand, uh, if you want to understand equations or curves or surfaces or whatever it is, and if you want to know something uh, about, about a specific class of objects, what does it mean to say that you've understood something? And, and I, I think implicitly Hilbert and the like were equating understanding with, um, uh, with actually procedural efficiency. So to them, you've understood something if you can demonstrate that understanding in an explicit fashion and um, the, the demonstration should hopefully uh, be a reasonable one in the sense that you should be able to run through the demonstration in a, in a reasonable amount of time. So that it had something to do with efficient computation. But I think when Hilbert posed these problems, um, the notion of computation was not formalized. So that is the work that the logicians um, and, and people like Turing at the time actually got together uh, to work through. So I um, think the main players involved at the time, among others, were uh, Church and uh, Godel and Turing uh, really came together to, to uh, uh, well, actually, they, I think a lot of that work happened independently. In fact, I think um, when Turing was working on um, uh, abstracting out computation, um, and I think he was, uh, he was in the UK probably already working with with uh, the defense and the military at the time, um, and also doing uh, you know, a lot of his code breaking work. Um, and I think when 
uh, he managed to actually put together the arguments for undecidability and like the existence of undecidable problems. Um, he, he had a certain formalization of what, what does it mean for uh, what, what does it mean for a machine to compute something? And we now call it the Turing machine. It's a very powerful abstraction. Again, the abstraction is key here. It's not a specific description of a specific machine. It doesn't say that, okay, here is how this works. Here are the dials. Here is what, I mean, it's, it's not specific to uh, any physical manifestation. It's really the idea of what does it mean uh, for a machine to compute something. And if you just started from a blank slate and you thought about what does it mean to codify understanding, what does it mean to formalize uh, procedures and efficiency of procedures and so on, uh, this may not be the only thing you come up with. And sure enough, I think uh, the time church working in, um, almost around at the exact same time, 1935 is probably when uh, church published a paper on uh, the, the lambda calculus, which was his formalization of how you capture computation. And um, now this work is, and, and I think Turing ended up publishing his work a year after, I think he was a little bit dejected when he found out about the lambda calculus. There were clearly similarities um, in terms of uh, at least the end goal, but I think the details of the formalizations are different. And we now, uh, we now know that the formalizations are actually equivalent in the sense that you can simulate um, uh, you can simulate whatever a Turing machine does using the framework of lambda calculus and the other way around. And in fact, these are not the only two formalizations, there's quite a few others. But it turns out that all of them are in a very formal sense equivalent, which is also pretty mind blowing. So anyone who has attempted to codify what it means to compute has basically, it's like all roads leading to Rome, you end up being coming up with a model that's eventually equivalent to the Turing machine model of thinking about things. There, there hasn't been a compelling model which is uh, provably different from, um, from the model of a Turing machine. So I'm saying all this without actually defining what a Turing machine is. I think I will not get into that because it requires a little bit of setup and I think, um, if you're interested, it's something that's, that's easily look up. Well, I just want to tell you more stories. But um, uh, but yeah, I think it's uh, another thing that you might be interested in is the church Turing thesis. So, so these models are all nice and formal and everything is the equivalences can be proved formally. But the thesis or the, uh, the thing that people believe is that uh, these models are really the right way of capturing computation. So that is something that's uh, it's widely believed and we have no reason uh, to really suspect it. Um, it also turns out in, in uh, tangential trivia um, um, in, in the late 80s and 89, um, uh, a letter for, written by, by Godel to uh, John von Neumann uh, in 1956 came to light. And this is also a really interesting uh, letter. It's mostly technical, so I'm not quoting right out of it. This is a time when von Neumann was, was uh, apparently very ill but recovering. and. Um, Godel talks about, he talks about the, the, um, uh, the decision problem, he talks about undecidability, and, and, and at some point he goes on to asking finer questions within the class of problems that, that we know um, to be not undecidable, let's say you do have processes, and he's now digging deeper into, okay, I mean, Maybe let's set aside the ones for which there is no hope, like uh, the problem of checking if a program is going to crash or not. But let's look at the problems for which we do have some hope. And I think once he started digging into that, and in more modern terminology, I think he ended up framing what is now known as the P versus NP question. So let me get to that part of the story. So what do we mean? by, um, so you've probably heard of P versus NP as being one of the most fundamental problems in all of computer science. And it's one of the clay millennium problems, which means that it has a price tag of a million dollars attached to it. So what's, uh, what's the big deal? So let's at least, I mean, I'm not sure if I can communicate the big deal around P versus NP, but at least I can hopefully set up a little bit of the terminology uh, just to appreciate what, what the question is even asking. So, um, so although I think uh, in the 30s, 40s, the general scene was we, we were just encountering ideas of undecidability and people were, you know, talking about 
uh, okay, things that machines can do versus the things that they cannot do. That's a very uh, sort of a coarse classification of problems that you might want to solve, like what's what's even possible versus what is impossible. Um, and a lot of problems, I think, eventually were shown to be undecidable. And that's, um, I, I think, there are there problems about which we're still discovering whether or not they're undecidable or not. But now there's a whole world of problems which machines can solve. And now within that, you, you start becoming interested in how quickly can you solve them. And this, uh, this is a refrain in algorithms that we have to this day, where you come up with a way of solving something and you immediately ask, usually by a reviewer, but also you ask yourself uh, if, you know, if you can do it better. So um, what do we mean when we say, can we do it better? It means, can you do it faster? Can you use fewer resources? Typically, when algorithms are doing their thing, they end up using memory. They end up using um, they end up using communication. If it's an algorithm that's uh, that needs to communicate with some server, it's sort of transporting uh, bits back and forth. It's obviously taking time. So these are the sorts of things that you want to optimize for. You want to say, can you do it with fewer and fewer resources? Because we are. Um, uh, we are miserly when it comes to resources. Most of us are operating on a budget and the faster you can do things, uh, the better it is in general. And, and these days, especially with, with algorithms uh, controlling markets and things like that, uh, really every, um, every nanosecond counts, I guess. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, basically the idea was that, you know, can you make better algorithms? So this is a bit of a quip. Uh, the, the, uh, the whole talk is full of nice anecdotes, by the way. This is uh, Dinitz, who is known for various things, among others, for coming up with um, an algorithm for finding maximum flows, which we will talk about if we have time. So, um, so the idea was that when uh, an American and a Russian were talking about, you know, how did the Russians manage with machines that were subpar, the Russians said that well, we had better algorithms. So that was pretty dramatic. So the earliest signs of the fact that people were starting to worry about or look at how much um, you know, how expensive are these algorithms? I'll just focus on time as a resource, although people do think a lot about space and communication and other resources as well. But for simplicity, I'll just focus on time, which I think was also um, one of the, uh, in the early days identified as one of the primary things to worry about. So already way back in 1910, this was, uh, this again, um, this is a I could say uh, this is a paper written by a mathematician and it's a it's a procedure about solving some congruences and uh, this is quoting from the paper uh, where uh, he points out that uh, the labor required here is proportional to a power of the logarithm of the modulus so this is uh, can think of it as the log of the number raised to some power as opposed to the number itself or its square root. So, so he proposes two algorithms. One of them, he argues, runs uh, or the time that it requires is proportional to a power of the log of the number. The other one is uh, proportional to uh, power of the number itself. And, and he points out that, of course, the first one is better. And, and this is something that's sort of intuitively clear um, uh, to, uh, uh, to the author already. Um, there's a paper of Alan Cobham uh, where, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's titled The Intrinsic Computational Difficulty of Functions. And again, Cobham and Edmonds, whom we are going to uh, get to next, are traditionally uh, credited for sort of the, uh, the origins of the notion of polynomial time as efficient computation. So, um, so Cobham has this very intriguing opening line where he says that, uh, well, he says talk, although I'm not sure if this was a talk abstract or, uh, or uh, it's just that the, the paper was written in this way. But in any case, he says, the subject of my talk is perhaps most directly indicated by asking two questions. Is it harder to multiply and then to add? Uh, is it harder to multiply than to add? And second, why? So interestingly, uh, the why is probably more emphatic or more relevant if the answer to the first question is yes. It's a valid question to ask, even if the answer to the first question is no. So it's not harder to multiply than to add. Then, well, why? Because maybe I can demonstrate by showing you an algorithm 
uh, for multiplying two numbers, that's just as quick and as efficient as one for adding two numbers. So that's why. On the other hand, um, if you said it's harder to multiply than to add, how would you reasonably answer why? So again, this goes back to the question of showing that something is impossible. You want to say that you cannot, there is no procedure to multiply two numbers that's as efficient as the ones that we know for adding two numbers. So, so yeah, he does presuppose, I mean, I wouldn't say necessarily presuppose, but he does pose it that the, the answer to the first question is yes, and it's the second that that poses the, the challenge. And, um, Ed, uh, okay, sorry, I think, yeah, Edmonds, um, again, as uh, is a classic paper called Paths, Trees, and Flowers, uh, very colorful uh, title. It's not completely clear from the title what's going on here. Uh, it turns out that he's solving the problem of finding a maximum matching, which is a hugely relevant problem in practice. Um, and um, interestingly, in this paper, he has a section uh, that's titled Digression, where um, he's basically trying to justify all the uh, pains that are being taken in the paper for coming up with a good algorithm, which has um, uh, whose um, expense can be uh, can be measured as a polynomial function of the input, as opposed to just you know some finite function. So remember the scene these days is that people only care about whether it's even doable or not. They don't care so much about how well you can do it. So he has like a couple of pages worth of justification saying that, well, you know, um, uh, I, I think so. If the last line here uh, it, it kind of reflects this. It may be that since one is customarily concerned with existence, convergence, finiteness, and so forth, one is not that inclined to take seriously the question of the existence of a better than finite algorithm. So this clearly shows as a sign of the times because, uh, I mean, and in modern algorithms, this is the main thing that, that we are inclined to take seriously is, you know, can you do better than uh, the best that is currently known? But in uh, the, the mid 60s, you had to justify uh, going after such a goal. So for many people, uh, this paper is really the origin uh, story for the notion of uh, polynomial time. And in fact, I don't think he's like completely clear about whether this is the right notion. So he does say, for instance, that it would be unfortunate for any rigid criterion to inhibit the practical development of algorithms, which are either not known or known not to conform nicely to this criterion. So the, I, the, the point he's making, I think here is that, well, suppose we propose that, well, the good algorithms are the ones uh, whose um, uh, use of, let's say, resources of time and space are bounded by some polynomial function of the input. Uh, you know, there is probably a danger that, that that excludes certain algorithms that may actually be good algorithms, but they don't exhibit this property necessarily. So that's actually a theme that, that we will come back to. But, um, but I think, yeah, I mean, this is interesting that people are starting to worry about how expensive our algorithms are. They're not just worried about whether there is an algorithm they want to now know how good does it get. And in fact, this is also reflected in Dijkstra's uh, Turing Award lecture, which um, again, uh, is a well-known, um, uh, you know, it's a well-known document titled The Humble Programmer. Um, uh, citation says EWD 340 because Dijkstra used to make notes and sort of index them. Um, it's not clear that he had written 339 notes before this because some of them are missing, but um, but nonetheless, um, uh, you know, so, uh, people might even think of Dijkstra as one of the earliest bloggers because of how systematically he wrote these highly opinionated pieces about the, the scene of the times. Uh, so one of the things he said uh, when he was talking about a software crisis, uh, there's like a larger context to this, but, but I think it's reasonably fair to pull out this, this paragraph out of context because I think it, it conveys what, um, uh, what, what we want to see here. So he says that the machines have become several, several orders of magnitude more powerful. So to put it quite bluntly, as long as there were no machines, programming was no problem. When we had a few weak computers, programming became a mild problem. And now we have these gigantic computers and programming has become an equally gigantic problem. So some of these have issues that are related to um, implementation and programming style and things like that. Things that I promised I will not touch upon. But there's also this issue of, you know, how can you write or how can you come up with procedures that are efficient and that can really leverage all this power that uh, that, that is coming up uh, on the hardware side of the story.
So, okay, and it looks like I'm kind of running out of time. So maybe I'll just very briefly talk about the problem that Edmonds was concerned with in his uh, in his paper. So um, think of the matching problem as just trying to pair up two groups of people. So you, let's just say boys and girls for convenience. And um, oops, I think I have not navigated this properly. Just give me a moment. Yes, I think we are back. So. Um, so let's say you have boys and girls, and let's just ignore this. So let's say that you have uh, pairs that you consider compatible, that you think it would be good to match them for whatever reason. So this is the sort of problem that abstract scenarios like, let's say, a job applicants with uh, posts or jobs, um, or it could be uh, matching, let's say, um, uh, organ donors for the patients who need them. So not every pair is compatible. So you have the sort of... Uh, uh, this is the data that you have about, about pairs that, that make sense to match with each other. And what you want to do is you want to match as many pairs as possible. So that's the maximum matching problem. Uh, this, I mean, I've, I've shown you an example where it seems like you're matching two sets of people. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way. So Edmund solved uh, the problem where you're just given a bunch of pairs over a set. And uh, he, he uh, designed this algorithm, which would figure out what's the largest collection of, of pairs that are you know, uh, mutually disjoint. So that's, that's what a matching is. So I'm not going to get into the algorithm itself. In fact, I wanted to also tell you about another problem, which had, um, uh, I think, a huge amount of practical relevance at the time. So this was, again, uh, we're talking about times, this is just after the Second World War. And it turns out that the Russians and the Americans were very interested in each other's railroad systems because they, uh, they wanted to know how, uh, you know how they could cause disruption, again, using fewest resources. If you're in military, you probably only have so many bombs that you can drop, et cetera. So, um, so, th so they were trying to figure out, so usually a transportation network is designed in such a way that it can move necessary goods, items, supplies from one place to another. And one of the things that they were, they were starting to worry about is, you know how can you how can you destroy the connections between uh, uh, you know uh, the the source let's say the factories and the place where the supplies need to reach uh, by causing um, by using up the the you know an optimal set of resources. So this turns out was um, was actually codified um, uh, in in a report that has at, at that was at the time secret. I think you can see secret on the top left of the slide here, but has since been declassified. Um, this was again, as you can see, way back in 1955. Um, and this uh, essentially codified what we now know as the minimum cut problem, which is also, it turns out, is closely related to the maximum flow problem, where, which is intuitively that you're given, let's say, a railroad network and different roads of different capacities, and you're trying to push as many supplies as you can from the left to the right. So it turns out that uh, the minimum cut, the minimum number of things that you need to uh, to destroy um, is also, um, uh, is, is in fact equal to the maximum maximum amount of goods that you can that you can push across the network it's 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 a beautiful combinatorial duality and it turns out that that there are some really nice algorithms uh, for this problem uh, without getting into uh, the, the algorithms themselves one thing that i did want to say is that you know the flow problem and the matching problem probably look or sound very different but it turns out that if you had um, if you had an algorithm for the flow problem, then you can in fact solve the matching problem, um, at least the kind of matching problem that I showed you, where things are partitioned into two sets, uh, and you're trying to match things across two disjoint sets. This is a fascinating concept that you can use an algorithm for a totally different problem to solve your problem. So if I want, if somebody gave me a procedure or an algorithm to find a max flow in a network, I could dress up my matching problem like a flow network and pretend that that's what it is and feed it to the flow algorithm. And it turns out that what the flow algorithm gives you can actually be turned into a matching. 
And um, there is a proof that, that these problems, I mean, this essentially amounts to a proof that these problems are equivalent. Uh, there are a lot of other problems. So for instance, there is, um, um, uh, there is a well-known problem called the sport elimination problem. So let's say you're watching IPL and um, after the round robin uh, sort of section is done, uh, you're at some, at some intermediate point, you know that these are the four teams that top the table. Uh, you know how many matches they have played so far, how many matches are remaining, and you know how many matches each team has won so far. So one question that comes up a lot over coffee, especially if you um, if you follow the game, is okay. Is there a sequence of outcomes that can make my favorite team win? So from here, I want to know: Does um, uh, does the Bangalore team have a chance to make it uh, to the uh, to the top of the leaderboard? And uh, this is something that usually gets answered by a lot of painful analysis. You know, if this happens, then that'll happen. If they lose, and they win, and if it rains on this day, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it turns out that you can actually turn this into a flow network and use a Maxwell algorithm to make an accurate prediction, which is really cool. So fundamentally, the idea is that we have this notion of problems uh, reducing to each other or problems that can basically, uh, we have these algorithms that turn uh, 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 an instance of one problem into an instance of another problem in a way that solving the other problem actually gives you a solution to the problem that you care about. So this is something that you can use to solve problems, but it turns out that it's also something that you can apply when you want to explore the limits of computation. So here again, I will try to say this briefly, but um, the kind of problems that we have seen so far constitutes a class of problems that we call P. These are problems that have nice solutions. They can be efficiently solved in polynomial time, whatever that means. So these are the good problems. We also have a whole class of problems for which what we know is that we can efficiently check solutions. So if you give me a solution, I can validate it. But we don't know yet if you know if uh, if if we can we can actually find these solutions effectively. And um, um, and really the central question is you know can I mean, is it true that if you can check, uh, if you can validate a solution, you can also automatically find it? This is what we don't know. Intuitively, it seems like just having a process to check somebody's solution doesn't, doesn't seem like enough um, uh, ammunition to actually come up with a procedure to find solutions, okay? So this is like, uh, you know, if, uh, uh, if I'm, if I'm, you know, if I've given a hard problem on a homework, uh, it's possible that I sometimes do this where I don't know the solution, but I, I know enough to do the grading. So I can figure out if somebody has given me a correct solution or not, but I may not be able to come up with it myself. So that's kind of the distinction. Um, and it turns out that within NP, there is this class of NP complete problems, which is uh, this absolutely mind boggling notion that it, these are problems that if somebody comes up with a solution for one of these problems, they automatically using this framework of transformations that we talked about earlier, it turns out that these are problems for which there's a transformation implicitly there is a transformation from every problem in NP to these problems. So if you solve one of these problems, then you solve every problem in NP. Uh, it's pretty insane that such problems even exist, but it turns out that they do. So if you are stuck on some problem, you may want to claim that I'm stuck on a problem. I can't find a good algorithm for it because a good algorithm doesn't exist. But if you say this to your manager or whoever, they might just say that you're being um, arrogant or you're being lazy or you know maybe both. Uh, but on the other hand, if you can, if you can simply uh, you know, find a transformation from an NP complete problem to your problem, then what it means is that if somebody solves your problem, then they, they end up solving every problem in NP. And we don't really know how to do this. And it's not for the lack of trying. A lot of people have tried. So, um, so that's a much stronger argument for why you're stuck with your problem. So, uh, so if you can, I mean, one way of solving a problem is to, of course, solve it or to transform it to a problem for which you have a solution. But if you're incredibly stuck and you start suspecting that maybe this is really a hard problem, what you can do is transform a known hard, hard problem into your problem. In this case, what you achieve is very substantial evidence that probably your problem 
does not admit an efficient solution because if it did, then a lot of surprising consequences would follow, right? Of course, at this point, you might be wondering, this class NP of problems that I can, for which I can efficiently check a solution um, seems like a huge class of problems. Is every problem in NP? Well, probably already know the answer because we talk about problems that are undecidable. So uh, these problems, uh, you can imagine, uh, would, would not be in NP. And uh, here's a funnier example. So suppose uh, you ordered something from Amazon and, uh, you know, they, and, and it doesn't come, right? And you want to convince them that you haven't received your parcel, right? So, and, so you call Amazon customer support and they say, uh, and you say, well, I didn't receive uh, the thing that I had ordered. And then they say, well, can you prove this to us? Like they want to verify your claim. And it's unclear how you can verify or how you can provide a small and you know efficient proof. I mean, other than bringing somebody over and showing them around, and even that is not clear that it can, constitutes a proof. So it's it's uh, so there are definitely situations where coming up with something that you can used to verify a statement easily, like may not always be handy. So it sounds like an all pervasive definition, but there are lots of problems beyond NP as well, but there are lots of problems in NP as well. It's an, it's an interesting class uh, both ways. Um, so it turns out that people have found ways of coping with the situation that we don't have good solutions yet for problems that NP complete. We believe them to defy our expectations of admitting solutions that are efficient. But I, I believe that the approach that we have taken, this is what uh, Edmonds said in his paper, that he's afraid that maybe our criteria for what is a good algorithm is too rigid. And he in fact mentions simplex as, uh, you know, as a candidate. And it turns out that simplex is one of those things which does not have a good theoretical guarantee, but it's amazingly efficient in, um, in practice. So, um, so it turns out that modern algorithms research is all about coming up with algorithms that look beyond NP completeness, and they turn out to be, um, you know, it's, a lot of it is just trying to figure out if we can do better by relaxing some of our expectations from our algorithms, right? So, um, so in modern times, algorithms can do a lot for us. Um, let me just wrap up here by showing you some things that algorithms can do. Uh, for example, although these slides are not made in PowerPoint, I've learned that PowerPoint offers to automatically design your slides for you, or at least lay them out nicely, uh, if you're just um, uh, willing to use the feature. Um, algorithms can now write other algorithms. So this is a really cool demonstration of uh, OpenAI Codex. Um, uh, you know, you, you just tell the computer, like you might, tell um, Alexa or Siri to do something and they hopefully do it, this is in similar spirit. So they, they literally, if you watch this video halfway through, they're at a point where they're saying, write a game for us that has this kind of scenery and has these rules. And this thing is uh, literally spewing out the code for such a game. So that's pretty cool. Um, uh, with GPT-3, you can do, um, uh, algorithms can actually write thoughtful sounding essays for you, which are borderline indistinguishable from essays written by real people for whatever it's worth. Um, I don't know if you noticed in the outline, I quoted a comedian who said that a computer once beat me at chess, but he was no match for me when it came to kickboxing. So that was funny maybe at the time. It hasn't aged well. I think there are now computers that can potentially beat you at kickboxing. It's uh, not an experience that I would necessarily recommend. It looks a little bit painful. Um, computer, uh, algorithms and computers can drive us around. Um, uh, Musk, uh, I think, said this yesterday, uh, that, that he would be shocked if self-driving uh, systems that are safe and uh, you know like completely ready for production are not completely standard by the end of this year. Um, algorithms can read our minds. So Hollywood is using algorithms to predict whether a movie script will be a blockbuster or not. So now if you want to write scripts for Hollywood, the chances are that the producer is going to run it by uh, you know, a machine which will try to figure out if your script is going to perform well at the box office or not. Uh, virtual reality is the next big thing. Is this 
moderately disturbing story about how apparently a farmer in Turkey is uh, using virtual reality headsets on his cows so that they feel like they are in a good environment and apparently this improves the, the yield, uh, which is uh, pretty crazy, but uh, that's kind of the world we're living in right now. Um, algorithms can also kill. If you look at the uh, Royal Institution lecture that I referred to earlier about what computers cannot do, he actually opens with the plausibility of uh, killer robots and uh, it's a very interesting uh, take. And, um, and there's this New York Times documentary, which is also very interesting about whether uh, killer robots are going to be a reality. They, they already are uh, to some extent. And uh, this is one of the big debates in the United Nations, et cetera, about to what extent should autonomous weaponry be a thing. So um, we live in exciting times. And I realized that I was speaking of time overshot by a little bit. So maybe I will wrap up here and open it up for discussion and questions. I will leave you with a pointer to this TED talk, which talks more about what algorithms mean to modern society and modern times. Um, it's, it's called How Algorithms Shape Our World. It's by Kevin Slavin, who I think is a game developer, computer science math person. It's, um, it's, it's very, very uh, insightful. So if uh, you're interested, I think that's, that's a, a, a good place to find out more about how algorithms are driving uh, the world uh, in current times. So with that, I really will, will stop. Thank you so much. Thanks, Neil. Very interesting.